morning. Again, thank you guests for worshiping with us this morning. We're so glad that you're here and please don't forget to go um, out in the back and, and uh, fill out an information card. We want to get uh, to connect with you and um, because of your willingness to be here and your willingness to go back there and fill out that card, we have a gift for you that um, I think that you would enjoy. So make sure you do that. Um, again, happy Mother's Day. Um, Mother's today is, is, is all about you today and every day. Uh, we, we are thankful for you today and every day, but today specifically, uh, hopefully um, today you would feel honored and, and uh, you would just be showered with love and uh, appreciation. It being Mother's Day, um, I, I, I think about, you know, motherhood, uh, getting to watch, watch Allie parent, parent our uh, three, three children. And look, I'm just going to be honest with you this morning, and you think, what you going to do, lie to me, preacher? But... Um, I want to tell you the truth this morning is, if anything, well, because our kids um, and, who, and who they'll become um, is all because of Allie. I have nothing to do with that. And if we want to be honest this morning, the real parent in, in our family is Allie. Um, I'm just there to help her. Um, but I'm so thankful for her and uh, what she does for our children. She really teaches them what it looks like, not just teaches them how, but what it looks like to love God and love people. And, uh, and today, that's, that's what we're going we're gonna to see, that our children, uh, more things are caught than it is taught. And uh, mothers, today, I want to speak specifically to you, but fathers, do not tune me out. Okay? It's not nap time for you today. Um, you, you lean in. This is you too. We, would, we could say this is to the parents, but specifically, I want to um, encourage and challenge our mothers today. But I got, um, got a few things I think could sum up motherhood for you this morning. Um, someone said, motherhood, because going to the bathroom in private is overrated, right? No more privacy anymore. Little fingers under the door. Um, it's spicy is universal mom code for, I don't want to share. Let's get married and have kids so instead of enjoying coffee in the morning, you can braid hair while I pack lunches and we can all be late. A police recruit was asked during the exam, what would you do if you had to arrest your own mother? He said, call for backup. <laughs> and we know, we, know, we know all that is, is to be true. Um, and, and so mothers, we are just so thankful for you. What you do uh, cannot be replaced. And, uh, and this morning, what I, what I hope to do is that I, I hope to lift your chin towards heaven. And that you would realize that there's grace, that, that you would be a mother or you would be a father and you would live in the grace of God. We all, we all need the grace of God. There's, there's not one perfect parent in here. Um, and so we, we, are, we are in desperate need of, of God to intervene and to do what only He can do. Um, and so I, I want to speak to our mothers and our fathers this morning. You know, Psalms 27 says this. It says, you know, Solomon in that Psalms, he refers to children as a heritage. Right or an inheritance, right? Heritage or an inheritance from the Lord. He says they are your inheritance from the Lord, and so that means the most important task we have as parents and as a church is to teach the next generation the gospel. That's what Solomon is trying to say. There, that's going to be in your inheritance. That's what you're going to leave behind. You're going to leave behind other people that. We want, Solomon says, that we want our most important job and task as parents and as a church, right? As a church, it's, we're not exempt from walking and partnering with moms and dads, and, and we just complement what is already being taught at the home, though. And so, but Solomon would say in Psalms 127 that, that children, they're, they're, they're an inheritance from the Lord. That's what you're going to leave behind. And so they are the true inheritance who we're, what we eventually will leave behind. And so it's our job as, as mothers and as fathers and as a church to, to teach them the gospel, not only to articulate it, but also so that they could observe it in our life. Remember, more things are caught than they are taught. And so what I, what I want to do today is I want to read a passage of Scripture. If you have your Bibles, I hope you do, in 2 Timothy 1, we'll look at verses 1 through 5. And what we're going to see here is we're going to see that Paul is actually going to bring up the fact that Timothy is where he is because of two women in his life. Timothy is strong in the faith because of two women, specifically, in his life that have discipled him. Not only have they discipled him, 
but he was able to observe in something in them that now is passed down to him. We're going to pass something down to our children. We're, we're going to give them something as parents, right? We are the, we are the main uh, influencers in their life, to say. Um, I think I read it somewhere. The church has, in a year's time, I think it only has a little bit over a hundred and something hours with your children, but you have 50, over 1,500 hour, waking hours with your children. And so you're going to be the primary disciple maker in their life, and so you're going to pass something down to them. And so what we see here that was passed down to Timothy, though, was Paul is going to phrase it, and we're going to unpack what it means, but he's going to phrase, he's going to say two words. He's going to say sincere faith. So in 2 Timothy 1, 1 through 5, Paul says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will, for the sake of the promise of life in Christ Jesus, to Timothy, my dearly loved son, grace, mercy, and peace from the God, the Father, and Christ Jesus our Lord. He says, I thank God whom I serve with a clear conscience as my ancestors did. People went before me. They, they served him with a clear conscience, and I am today. He says, when I constantly remember you in my prayers night and day. Verse 4, he says, remembering your tears, I long to see, uh, I long to see you so that I may be filled with joy. Verse 5, he says, I recall your sincere faith. Timothy, you have sincere faith that first lived in your grandmother, Lois, and your mother, Eunice, and now I am convinced it is in you also. Do you see that? Paul says, Timothy, you, you have this sincere faith that, that was first in your grandmother, and it was also in your mother, so it was passed down from your, her, your mother's mom. Now it was in your mother. Now what was in your mother now is in you. Do you see it? Do you see the pattern here? Listen, church, our, our faith and, and the, the Word of God and the teachings of Scripture, our faith, it, it's a generational faith. It was meant to be passed down. You go all the way back to the Old Testament, the Israelites, the Shema. They would teach them to love God with their heart, soul, mind, and strength. These things they would recite daily to their, to their kids. Why? Because they knew that we're always one generation away. We're always one generation. That, that's why Solomon would say in 127 that children are our inheritance, that we would train them up in the way of the Lord, and so when they would have kids. Listen, the goal isn't just to have godly children. The goal is to have godly grandchildren. That's the goal. That, that we would instill something in them, and then eventually they would instill it into their children. We see that pattern here, right, in 2 Timothy. It was in his grandmother, then passed down to his mother. Now Timothy's mother now is passed down to him. In, in Acts 16, we see that uh, the Bible actually says that uh, Timothy's father was an unbelieving Gentile. He was a Greek. And so it was all on his mother, really, to raise him up in the Scriptures and to raise him up in the faith. And so Paul says, you have sincere faith because of two women. Not only did they teach you these things, but you observed it from them, this, this sincere faith that, that Paul is talking about. And so an important shaping influence in Timothy's life was a godly grandmother and mother. That was a, it was a very formative to where Timothy is now. It was very shaping, it was a shaping influence in his life. A godly grandmother and a godly mother. You see, like I said earlier, parents have a major, we have major impact on the life of our children. Today, the question is not, will I have an impact on my children? That's not the question. That's the wrong question to be asking. The right question to be asking this morning, mothers and fathers, is this. But what type of impact will I have? Not that am I going to impact them, but what type of impact am I going to have? What am I going to pass down to my children now? That when they, now when they're young, that will affect them when they are older. What am I going to pass down to them? Because the home is the primary place your kids will learn the gospel. You see, I, I like to, I've heard it said once, is that our children need to grow in the gospel in two different gardens. The first is the home, the second is the church. But your home is the primary place your kids learn the gospel. That's where they, they see you outside of this building. That, that's where they, they see mom and dad. And so Timothy, Paul says, you have this sincere faith in you because outside of, 
of, of the temple or outside of worship, you, you saw your grandmother and your mother and you saw something that was sincere, Paul said. You saw something that was real. It was genuine. And so Timothy was able to observe that. And so Paul says a sincere faith, a sincere faith that is, that is in you but was first in your grandmother and your mother, sincere faith. He, he defines faith for us. See, we can all, in, in here, we can say, well, faith is this, faith is that. But Paul says, no, the only saving faith is sincere faith. The, the only thing that would impact somebody is sincere, genuine faith. The Greek word here, it's, it's, it's funny, it's kind of a play on words. It really is, comes off of the word hypocrite, right? And so the Greek word for sincere here actually means without hypocrisy. That's what, that's what that sincere word means, without hypocrisy. So you could say it this way. The, the faith that you have, Timothy, that is without hypocrisy, that is genuine, that is sincere, that is real, is in you because you saw it first in your grandmother and your mother. And so what Timothy saw was a faith that was real and active, a faith that was visible to his watching eye. The actions of their life matched the words of their mouth. The actions of their life, it, it matched the words of their mouth. And so we could say the opposite, though, of a sincere faith then is a hypocritical faith, right? Where what they said with their mouth really would not line up with their life. But, but Paul says, you didn't see that in your grandmother and mother. It had such an impact on you, Timothy, that you are where you are because of the sincere faith in your grandmother and mother. And so we can say this, that there's a difference this morning between the appearance of faith and authentic faith. Listen, our children need to see authentic faith. Authentic faith, not just the appearance of faith. They need to see an authentic faith. They need to see something that, look, working with, with teenagers for as long as I have, they can sniff out anything that's not real. They can. They can, they can, they can sniff it out quick. And then they're, they're turned off. And so one of the things that the responsibility that we carry now as, as parents is that I have a watching eye. Timothy watched his grandmother and mother. He watched them pray. Adonai Judson, he was a, a missionary. And his dad was a pastor. And they moved, constantly was moving and, and, and going. And, and his dad was constantly getting new churches. He was a Methodist pastor. And he, he vividly remembers growing up, uh, I like to call him AJ, but he was, not, he was not a Christian. He lived in a Christian home, but he was not a Christian. But he, he did eventually become a Christian and was, was a missionary in Burma and lived in a hut and led many people to, to the Lord because he lived in a hut in Burma where nobody, the gospel was not being preached. God radically changed his life. And you know what he, he accredited it to? Hearing his mother in her room on her knees pleading for her son. Pleading, crying out. He, he said, I would hear sobs of my mom saying my name to the Lord. He said, it then I, I really didn't understand what she was doing and I really looked it off. And he said, it affected me, but didn't really have anything to do with it then. He said, but as I got older, I understood what she was doing. She was pleading on my behalf. And so something, a faith that, that is real, that they see it within you. The sincere word means without hypocrisy. They, what we say with our mouth, they're, they're watching us. They're, they're, they're always watching us. And they're going to learn from, from us. And so Timothy was a product of a faithful mother who prioritized the discipleship of her son. You see, he was a product of a godly mother who made her son's spiritual health a priority. And what do we see here in Acts 16? I reference it. It says, Acts 16, 1 says, Paul went on to Brie and Listeria, where there was a disciple. Listen to this. There was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. So here, here's what that little it seems insignificant in Acts, but here's why this is significant. The Bible says that he was a disciple before he met Paul. See, I think we get this idea that Paul took, he, he calls him his spiritual son and he taught him how to do ministry. But Timothy was a disciple before he was a minister. How was he a disciple? Did, did Paul take him under and disciple him? Yes, but he was already a disciple in the making. Why? Because his 
mother discipled him. She realized that my primary job as a mother is to disciple my children. And so here's three things that, that we, can, we can take from this, mothers and fathers. The first thing is we need to live out our faith before our children. Live it out. They need to see, the Bible says, if you, if you go back, he says, Remembering your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. I recall your sincere faith that first lived in, in your grandmother and your mother. Lived, uh, some, some translations say dwelled. It dwelled within them, so what was in them came out of them. It, it was real because it was really inside of them. And so the reason Timothy could see something on the outside, because something was there on the inside. It was really there. It's the same as for us. What's really on the inside of us, church, is going to eventually come out of us. What's in here will come out. That's what Jesus said. The mouth speaks what the heart is full of, right? And so Timothy's mother and, and grandmother, they, they, they lived out their faith in front of Timothy. And like I said earlier, more things are caught than they're taught, right? And so people learn from observation more than articulation. See, we can, we can articulate it, but are they seeing it in my life? You see, that's where I believe true trans gospel transformation happens in my children when, when, when they see me not just articulate it, but they observe it in my life. They see me, right? Because the home is the place where kids will see the gospel lived out. In your home, they will see it lived out. They see it in here. It's kind of expected, right, when we come here. But when you leave here, they see it in your home. They think, man, this stuff is real. Look what it's done to my mom and and. and and my dad, they're living out their faith in front of me. C.J. Mahaney says this. He says, effective teaching involves explaining to our children what they already observing in our lives by example. That's effective teaching is when they, not only, you're not only saying it, but you're living it out in your life. And here's something that's so convicting to me, and it's kind of scary if you think about it. My three children will learn to believe the gospel less by how I articulate it and more about how I treat Allie and others. They will learn the gospel less by how I articulate it to them. I'm going to share the gospel to my children. I'm going to speak the gospel truth into their life. But at the end of the day, they'll learn it more by how I treat her and how I treat other people. What do we have to do? We're always one generation away. So this next generation that's following you, they need to see you live it out. I need to ask the question, do my kids, do they see an unconditional love or the graciousness, the, the faithfulness that I tell them about God? And what, are, what are our kids learning about the gospel from your marriage and how you treat others? What are they learning about that? That's where they're going to learn the most, by, by, by seeing it. My oldest son, he, he plays baseball. And, you know, I wasn't all that athletic growing up. So we, I try to practice with him occasionally. And, and I, can, I can tell him all day long, son, here's how you hit a baseball. Here's how you throw a baseball. Right, this is what you do. Here's the mechanics of hitting a baseball. But he's not really going to learn that way. He's going to learn by me going outside with him, putting a bat in his hand, and throwing the ball to him so that he can put into motion what I told him. The same thing is true, listen, with our faith. They need to see you live out your faith. They're watching you. They're seeing something, right? They're watching you live some way. Are they seeing Jesus in you? And so the first thing is we have to live out our faith before our children. Live it out before them. Let, let, let them see how you, how you treat your spouse and how you treat other people and how you're gracious towards them. I know there are days where you just think, oh, if they just do one more thing. That's it. One more. But it's in that moment where you realize, as God has been to me, so I will be to them. Grace. And so the second thing is, not only do I need to live out my faith before my children, but I also need to teach my children the Word. I need to teach them the Word. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Timothy. Just a few chapters over, he says in verse 3, starting in verse 14, But as for you, continue what you have learned and firmly believed. You know those who taught you. What did they teach him? Verse 15 says, And you know 
that from infancy you have known the sacred scriptures. From, from, from a baby, they were teaching him the scriptures which are able to give you wisdom for salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. And so they, they not only lived out their faith, he not only observed faith that was in them, they taught him the scriptures. You see, we teach the word to our children because we want them to know the God of the word, not the deceiver of the world. We, we, we want them to know the God of the word. That, that's, that's what we want. We should want our children to know the, the God who, of the word, not the deceiver of the world. See, there's an enemy out here and he wants to wage war against you and your family and your children. So we have to teach them the word of God that it would be instilled in their heart. Because here, here's another scary thought. If I don't disciple my kids in the word, someone will disciple them in the world. If I'm not discipling my children, somebody else is going to disciple them for me. And then the third and final thing is this, is listen. Not only do we need to teach them the word, live out our faith before them, they're watching. Lastly, pass down a relationship and not religion. We're not passing them down do's and don'ts. We're passing them down an intimate relationship with the Lord. And listen, I cannot pass anything down to them that I don't already have. Can I tell you what, what our children need most from us is they need us in an intimate relationship with the Lord so that we can teach them that, what that looks like, what His voice sounds like, what His will for their life is how to discern the voice of the Lord, how to pray. Listen, taking them to church is only half, half of what we should be doing. The church complements what's already being done at the home. And so here's, here's what we should do as parents. We need to pass down a relationship to them, not religion. Listen to what this psalmist says in Psalm 78. It's talking about uh, passing down generation after generation. Listen to what it says. It says, my people, hear my instruction. Listen to my, the words from my mouth. I will declare wise sayings. I will speak mysteries from the past, things we have heard and known. Listen. And that our ancestors have passed down to us. So we, this has been passed down to us. We're passing it down to you, he says. And they said, we will not hide them from the, our children, but we will tell a future generation. The praiseworthy acts of the Lord, His might and the wondrous works He has performed. He established a testimony in Jacob and saw, uh, set up a law in Israel which He commanded our ancestors to teach their children. So that, listen, why do we do all that? So that a future generation, children yet to be born, might know that they were to rise and tell their children. So that they might put their confidence in God and not forget God's works but keep His commandments. And here it is in verse 8. Then, if you do all that, if you pass down, teach them Scripture, let them see the faith in you. If you do all that, listen to what the psalmist says. Then, then they would not be like their ancestors, a stubborn and rebellious generation. A generation whose heart was loyal and whose spirit was not faithful to God. And see, here's... Here's the crux of the matter. If I pass down religion, I'm setting them up to be rebellious. That's what the psalmist says. He says, we're, we're going to tell them the great works of the Lord. We're going to tell them how praiseworthy He is. We're going to teach them the Word. They're going to see a living and active faith in me. I'm going to pass down a relationship to them. Why? Because if I don't do those things and I just give them religion and a, and a box to check off and a do's and don'ts, then they're going to be rebellious. I'm setting them up to be rebellious. And can I tell you what? Our children, they, they need a relationship with the Lord. And they need to know how to do that. And so we have to pass down a relationship and not religion. You know, I think some of us, though, we, we, we feel inadequate. And there are days where I do too. I feel like, man, is, is, there, is there a manual on this on Amazon? You can buy everything off of Amazon. Right? How to Parent 101. It's not there. But you know what? There's days where I, I blow it. Man, I mess up. I say things I shouldn't say. They, they did not see the gospel in me in that moment. 
man, and at times I feel like sometimes I'm passing down a religion. Do this, do that. And I just, at times I can, I can feel like I'm failing, but then I remember what Paul says in Ephesians 2. He says, but God who is rich in mercy, rich in mercy. Listen, all parents in here that you've, and mothers and fathers, you've, there's two things I want to say to you. One, if you feel like, man, you're struggling, and you're hurting, and you just feel like, man, they're just not getting it, I'm failing them, would you live and, and just sit under the waterfall of grace this morning? Would you lift your chin towards heaven and knowing that there's a Father who loves you? That, that you place your children in, in His hands? Because, man, there, there are days where I just feel like, man, I'm ruining my kids. <laughs> I'm messing this up. But then, I, but then I remember it's not about me. It's, it's about me pointing them to Jesus. Actually, it's good for them to see brokenness in me and how I navigate that. Second thing, if you're a parent in here and you feel like you have a lot of wasted years, listen, I believe the Lord can redeem any any wasted moments that we feel like we've had. You can start today. You can start today. Why? Because God is rich in mercy. And what does the Bible also say? That His mercies are new every day. Every day. If, if, if I wake up tomorrow and I'm still struggling with, with today's regrets and the things I didn't do, it's my fault. Because I woke up to a new day and the Bible says His mercies are new every day. So I can wake up the next day and proclaim and, and, and have that new mercy and say, God, today's a new day. So Father, teach me. Would you walk with me? Would you show me how to do this? God, I, I need your grace. And here's something else I want to encourage you with. I think a lot of families, they, they, they struggle with the um, stock photo syndrome, we could call it. You know what that is? You know when you go to the store and you buy a, a, a picture frame and they got the happy family in there? You know what I'm talking about? And it's just random people. I went to my dad's house one time, and he was trying to spruce things up. And you know, he he lives by himself, and he had some picture frames hanging. And I said, "Dad, who's that?" I don't know. I got it from dog store. I just hung it up. <laughs> Dad, you you got some random people? <laughs> we can give you some pictures. <laughs> oh, I just haven't got around to it yet. You know, it's men. But it seems so perfect, doesn't it? Man, they're, they're smiling. There's nothing wrong. It's just, that's wonderful. But can I tell you, that's not always true. And I think social media makes it worse. Because what we're doing is, is we're comparing our life, we're, we're comparing someone else's highlight reel to, to um, our, right, our life. Can I tell you what, what you see on social media isn't always true? We never, you don't post a, a, a toddler pitching a fit, do you? So handsome. Look at him. We don't do that, do we? So listen, don't fall into the trap. Satan wants to deceive you. He's an accuser. He want, he's the father of lies. And so listen, the moment that you agree with him, you give that accusation of your life power. And so what you need to do is, re is remind yourself, this is a battle, this is a war. right? I'm not going to compare my family to somebody else's family. God has gifted me. He's given me these children. Listen, mothers, you were called by God. To, nobody can parent your children better than you can. You are, you are called by God where you are with your children for a purpose. But when God created them, He created you to be their mother. You are perfect for them. And God in His sovereignty and His grace wants to give you every ounce of, of mercy, every ounce of strength, every ounce of wisdom, if you would ask. So mothers, you're, stop believing the lie that you're failing or that you have failed. You're here today. Mercy's here today. Grace is here today. Look, you go throughout Scripture, you look at Noah's family. Man, they were pretty dysfunctional at times. Noah drank and passed out, and his kids found him naked. 
But God, God used that family. God used Noah. Listen, I, if God was writing a beautiful story in their dysfunction, he can tell a beautiful story in yours. He can tell a beautiful story in yours. So this morning, moms and dads, would, would, you, would you just let him? And hey, listen, children, youth, you're not exempt this morning either. The Bible says that Timothy saw it in his mother and his grandmother. He saw it in them. But you know what he had to do? He had to make a decision. He had to own his faith eventually. So listen, teenagers and, 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 and children, you have to make a decision for the Lord too. You cannot vicariously live through your parents or your grandparents. You have to make a decision for the Lord. You are going to stand before the Lord, not with your parents, not with your grandmother. They're not going to plead on your behalf. You have to make a decision for the Lord. And so would you just bow your head just for a moment and... I don't, I don't know where, where you find yourself this morning or where, where you're coming from. You mothers, fathers, you may just be exhausted. Things are rough. Things are, are, are tiring. But listen, the mercy of God is here this morning, and He wants to shower you with that love and that grace. Some of you have children who, who are not in a close relationship with the Lord. But listen, we as a church, we, we believe in the power of prayer, and we believe that God knows exactly where you are. And he knows exactly where that child is. And he loves that child. And he loves you. And so we're going to be praying with you. We don't, we don't know who you are, but I just know there's some out here. Your children are gone. But in here, women that want to be mothers, believe in the power of prayer. I believe in that. And so we're, we're praying on your behalf too. But those who are mothers and you feel like you're failing, your children, listen, there's grace and there's mercy. So Father, would you do a work in this moment? Would you, would you call a sinner home? Lord, would you encourage a mother and a father? Would you let them know that you want to write your story through their family, through their life? God, do a work in this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, would you stand and I'm going to ask that you would respond to the leading of the Holy Spirit. Moms and dads, Maybe, maybe you come to the point to where you say, look, we, we're letting go and we're letting God do this. We've tried everything we know to do. So God, we hand it over to you. Maybe you need to grab them by the hand and come to the altar and say, let's go give it to God. Let's give it to the Lord. And so I'm going to ask that you would be sensitive to the Spirit and respond. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a I know it may seem scary coming up here to this altar and you're white knuckling that chair and you're a mom or father in here and you just just really struggling. So if if that's you and you would you would like some prayer and we're not gonna do anything invasive or we're gonna call you to come up front or call you by name. We're just gonna simply I'm gonna simply whisper a prayer for you. So if that's you, would you just simply raise your hand and say, that's me. Brandon, would you pray for me? I, I need the grace of God to remind me. And I need to lean on Him. I need to let go and let God. So if that's you, would you just simply raise your hand and say, that's me. I see you. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. Many across the room, I see you. Father, you know each heart in this room. And so God, I, I pray specifically for the ones that have raised their hands. They said, I, I need God to intervene. I I need him to give me the strength. I need him to remind me, God, that they're watching me. And God, I want to pass something down to them. 
an intimate relationship with you. But God, I first need that in my life. So Lord, would you, would you teach us how to do that this morning? Father, help us to be reminded of your grace today. All is not lost. You're still working. Even when we're waiting, you're still working, God. And we pray this in your name. Amen. You can, you can be seated. Well, church, thank you so much for, for loving Jesus the way that you do and you do and, and worshiping. And I'm so thankful for you. And so at this time, we're, we're going to uh, take up the offering. And I'd like to pray over that. And then you guys can, can be dismissed. So let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for who you are and what you're doing. Lord, I, I pray in this moment, God, that you would encourage us. Lord, that we would grab hold of your mercy and your grace that's new today. Father, would you bless this offering, Lord? Would you use it to multiply your kingdom and your kingdom alone? And we pray this in your name. Amen. Thank you, church.